In December of 2020, Harry Styles took to the cover of Vogue magazine clad in a dress. Now this brought forth a myriad, maybe a bit too much, of discourse. One of the major things sparked from this cabal of arguments and Ben Shapiro tweets was the question, what does it mean to be a man? The answer to this has shifted throughout time, from men of ancient Greece with their homosexual partners and flowing togas, to the men of the Victorian era posing hand in hand with their fellow gentlemen, to the men of the current era who can range from your Massachusetts native cousin Dave, who won't hold a beer with two hands because he claims it's gay, to, well, Harry Styles wearing a dress on the cover of Vogue. In actuality, there is no one role that all men could fit, in the same way that no group of people can fit any single role or archetype. Humanity is a spectrum, and when you try to stifle things, it explodes into chaos. It was around the same time that this dress discourse unfolded that I first watched Peter Weir's 1989 film Dead Poet Society, and besides the stellar acting, fantastic narrative, and S-tier prep style, I began to notice one crucial aspect of the film, the cinematography. Let me elaborate. Like any movie, Dead Poet Society is composed of both still and moving shots. But something that I noticed in this movie is that the fluidity of the camera serves a thematic purpose. Whenever the camera is still, it's usually during a scene where the ideas of the school or the expectations of a parent is bearing down on one of the characters. But when the camera begins to move, it represents the character beginning to break free from the stifling roles they are set in and beginning to express themselves. This theme of humanity, as represented by the Dead Poet Society V2, is a spectrum and cannot be shoehorned into being a single way as expressed in the movie cinematography. Now, you may think that's bullshit, and now you're gonna go lampoon me in the comment section. Or maybe you think I'm right, and you're about to go watch this video 40 times to memorize it. Either way, stick with me as I present to you Dead Poet Society, theme through cinematography. The still shots in Dead Poet Society are associated with the strict order of the world the boys exist in. From the school and its rules to Neil's father, the still shots impose the status quo on the young characters. In the very beginning, we see stills of murals, no doubt old students. This manufactured role was the first thing we see, and it's nearly impossible to escape given the stillness of the shot. When the camera does eventually pan down, it's only to show the mural figures looking down on a young boy imposing expectations and ideals. And the scene progresses with still shots of boys carrying banners which bear words such as tradition, honor, discipline, and excellence. Once again, we cannot escape the stillness as traditionalism marches down on us. This opening shot is a great example of how a still shot forces someone into conformity. Tradition and expectation to be a certain way are forced onto them, regardless of if they want it or not. In still close-ups, Mr. Nolan tells Toddy his big shoes to fill, and then he and Neil's father bear down on Neil to not disappoint them. This idea of stagnation with the imposing of the school's ideals are, in my opinion, best represented during the rowing scene. While the boat moves down the river and the background whips past them, the camera is still on Mr. Nolan shouting down on the boys as they heave the boat forward. One can almost see this as a metaphor for the school and the type of societal expectation that it manufactures. The school is built upon ancient ideals, but it needs new students to keep them operational, families of students to give them money, and old students to teach them. So basically, toxic masculinity is a hot dog machine. It sounds weird, but stick with me here. So if the boat is a metaphor for the school system, then it's like a mold, and the students are the meat, and Mr. Nolan is the guy working the crank. The school's ideas of what a man should be is imbued into them, and they are forced to push the cycle forward. And while the boat scene encapsulates the purpose of the still shot, the stillness is most stifling and extreme in the scenes between Neil and his father. Now, while Neil isn't the main character, saying how Todd, Knox, and Charles, I mean Nuwanda's conflicts are given just as much importance, I do think that Neil is a sort of leader to the other boys. He is the one who does the talking when they ask Keating about the Dead Poet Society, and it's him who basically organizes it. Neil has the most realized conflict of conformity, because it manifests in his father. The scene where Neil discusses his dreams of acting are often marked by moving and fluid shots and takes, but whenever his father appears, the movement is immediately replaced with rigid and close shots. Neil's father doesn't care about his son's aspirations and would rather him just become a doctor. This is both the most obvious and damaging example of a character being stuffed into a role they do not wish to fill. When Neil expresses his desire to act, the camera seems to move free with him, panning and following his every move. But the moment his father comes in to smash his dreams, the camera is fixed in place as it closes in on Neil, representing how truly trapped Neil feels by his father's expectations. This reaches a boiling point after the play. Neil seems to be at an all-time high as he acts, 
but it's all brought down by his father. Backstage, Neil's informed that his father would like to see him, and the camera slowly zooms in on his face. The slow zoom is seen a few times in this movie. It's usually the only movement in one of these still stifling shots. The slow zoom is used to show that Neil now realizes that his father may never change, and that he's hit a wall set by these expectations. Back at home, there's very little of an argument at all between Neil and his parents. Even when his father lets him speak, Neil has no words. He's been so constrained by what his father wants from him that he has no way to change his mind. The camera stands still for all of this, and like Neil, we have no way to escape this scenario. No way to break free from the ideals imposed onto us. Neil only sees one way out, and it's through suicide. These shots are dark, emotionally charged, and still. The heavy use of shadow and darkness impose onto the audience the grave thing that Neil is about to do. He's always been one of the characters who can break the stillness and change the status of the world they exist in, but now he's surrounded by these still and dark shots. His father plans to take the very thing he enjoys most away from him, topping the constant pressuring and forced conformity throughout his life and setting Neil off the edge. The still shots represent the conformity, stigma, and social pressures that the new members of the Dead Poets Society face. When the camera comes to a halt, so too do their aspirations. If the school and its ideals work to enforce a sense of toxic masculinity and bring stillness to the camera, then Keating's teachings of carpe diem are representative of the students escaping these social standards as the camera too becomes more fluid. A good example of this being the marching shot in Keating's class. While the rowing scene has that still quality and saw the boys forced into a rhythm, this scene is much more dynamic and features the boys moving at their own pace. Now while in the last section I largely focused on scenes, here I'll speak on characters, since the fluid shots are there to represent their own personal journeys. Now Neil is a big example of this, but I already spent a lot of time discussing his arc and its cinematography pairings. I'll say quickly that whenever he talks about acting or his other passions, the camera really gets moving and you get to watch how that affects his soul in a beneficial way. Now to touch on Knox Overstreet, my personal favorite character. Knox's backstory is rather vague. It's say that his family comes from money, and that his father was a lawyer, and that's just about it. He's a pretty blank slate character, but his arc is probably one of the most detailed and streamlined. It seems that each boy takes the teaching of Carpe Diem and applies it to a specific part of their life. And for Knox, it's in romance. When he meets Chris, the daughter of his father's friends, he becomes quickly enamored with her and spends most of his time on screen pursuing her, despite the fact that she has a boyfriend. Meeting Chris sends Knox through a journey of self-discovery, and the camera works to reflect that. In the bike scene, we watch the camera follow Knox along his way, and in this movement he has complete realization and mastery of himself. But as soon as he stumbles upon the football rally, the camera goes still. Knox realizes that the girl he loves is already in a relationship. And yet again, the shy, soft-spoken guy who reads poetry must compete with a class act jock. You had to get a stereotype in there somewhere. Now compared to the other characters like Todd or Neil, his arc is very tame. But it's still important. Knox is seen to have spent most of his time focusing on school, in attempts to appease his parent and get a good job. His dedication solely to academic achievement has left him completely inexperienced in any sense of intimacy. We see this inexperience on display during the party scene, which features the camera almost never standing still. Now, I've traditionally characterized the camera's movement to mean the characters are breaking free, but these ultra-fluid shots enter into a form of anarchy, and we see it again now as Knox is completely overwhelmed by a world he's out of touch with. He deprived himself of these aspects of life because he was told all that mattered was how he did in school. And then, when he gets put in this scenario, he gets in trouble. This idea of too much freedom becoming dangerous is perfectly reflected in what Keating tells Charlie. Life's Sucking all the marrow out of life doesn't mean choking on the bone. You have to find a way to master it. And while I wouldn't say Knox becomes more subtle, walking into your crush's class at a different school to give her flowers and a poem is way more subtle than kissing her while she's drunk in front of her boyfriend. Baby steps. The camera reflects this as it slows down to a measured follow that we're used to, and we see it even more controlled in the scenes between him and Chris in the snow. Knox understands how to truly carpe his diem. Maybe it's because his stakes are lower, but he gets it down much quicker than his counterparts. On the opposite end of this is Charlie, who besides being an entity of chaos, does not entirely understand how both to express himself but still operate as a human without getting himself and his friends into trouble. Usually, scenes in the cave feature a lot of camera movement, despite how small the cave is. There's a sense of intimacy between the boys in the cave. They're close together and feel comforted to read poetry to one another. However, when Charlie brings two women into the cave, the cave feels wide. The boys are far apart, and the camera is still. This problem of Charlie tampering with the Dead Poets Society is extended by him slipping in the opinion piece in the school paper about how girls should be admitted to the school, which he writes under the Dead Poets Society. 
This action upsets the other members and has immediate consequences. I personally interpret Charlie's phone call from God Prank as a way to cover for his friends and to put all the blame on himself. He realized what he did was wrong and takes the punishment himself. The paddle scene that follows represents society through the vehicle of Mr. Nolan trying to beat Nuwanda back down and to suppress Charlie. And the camera never moves for a character, instead forcing them to move back into the frame, which reflects Nolan trying to force Charlie to conform. This doesn't work, however, and Nuwanda resurges. As Charlie walks down the hallway, the camera follows him, but stands still once Neil questions him. Both styles are invoked in anticipation of what the outcome of his interrogation was. But with his final retort, we know that Nuwanda has gone past his learning curve and come into his own. Lastly, I'd like to touch on Todd, the member most stifled and reserved by the society the boys are all brought up in. He doesn't want to join the Dead Poet Society because he's afraid to read poetry and to express himself. Keating tries to break down these roles Todd has put up. In the sweaty tooth madman scene, we see the camera move in a very similar way to Knox's party scene. The difference between the two scenes is that Todd needs this extremism to help him come into his own. This scene is one of the first times we really see Todd think and act for himself, and it's liberating for his character. The first time Todd really expresses his feelings is after Neil dies. The camera follows him doing what real cinephiles call the Bambi across the snowfield. He finally breaks through the barrier, and it's only fitting that he gets to end things off. When Keating leaves, it's Todd who first stands up on the table. The camera follows him rise, which is mirrored by the rise of the other students. Out of every character, Todd is the most pummeled into the expectations of the world, and closing the movie with him shows how he's really able to escape the expectations and become himself. Cinematography is an incredibly important aspect to filmmaking. I mean, without a camera, it would just be people yelling into the void. But good cinematography should go past just showing the film. It should help convey the message and themes of the film. Saying that Dead Poets Society is about toxic masculinity isn't really a hot take, but the idea goes deeper than just plot or dialogue. The cinematography in this movie bleeds into theme. When the human spectrum is stifled by the forces which surround the members of the Dead Poets Society, the camera is motionless. We feel almost as trapped as the characters are, and that weight bears down on us. But when the cameras are able to freely express themselves, the camera moves with them and we feel how free they are. This movie is incredible for several reasons, and it's all added to by the cinematography. So once you're done watching this video, go ride your bike down a hill, or go read some poetry in a cave with your boys, or hey, even paint a Native American symbol of fertility on your chest and go see a play. Just do what you want to do. Yelp.